Good morning, everybody. Michael the Maven, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about the sports and wildlife setup for the Canon 90D. I have covered the entire camera in terms of the basic camera operations on a free tutorial, and there are a lot of other resources I want to make you aware of because the Canon 90D out of the box, it, it's different than any other camera I've seen because it does require a little bit of knowledge and work to get the you know, results that you want, that you expect and deserve as a customer. I really believe Canon needs to post some information and maybe a firmware update about some of the default settings because we've seen it time and again that many wildlife shooters are having some problems. So there's a couple things I need to make you aware of before you take it out and you start shooting for sports and wildlife. Oh, and by the way, we have an awesome Facebook group. Check it out, it's Canon 90D Owners by Michael the Maven. Tons of great images, people are getting great results with the camera, lots of shared information. It's been a wonderful resource. And I also have to make you aware that because of the density of the sensor, 32.5 megapixels on a crop sensor, not all lenses are gonna work on the 90D, especially some of these older lenses, like the, the 100 to 400 version one. So what we're seeing is that Canon 90D owners are putting low resolving power lenses on the camera and they're going out and shooting and the pictures are soft or maybe there's some tracking problems and they're disappointed. When in fact, in many of these cases, this could be resolved if they follow the information that I've published. So I'll be putting a 90D playlist so you can go through a lot of this. this. I think this is the fifth or sixth video that I've recorded for it. But first things first is check out the list of lenses that I've published. I've done a huge list and I continue to add to it which lenses are good which lenses are not good. And you might have to upgrade your lens in order to get the sharpness out of the images that you want. The best lens that we're seeing in terms of that I've seen consistently is Canon's 100 to 400, 4.5 to 5.6 version two. It's the best one that I've seen. Other lenses will work. And there are some lenses that are not going to work. So I would definitely recommend join the Facebook group, watch the free tutorial that I've already made, check the list of lenses. When you have a lens, that is on that list, take a picture of something still not moving because if it's not in focus when it's still, it's not going to be in focus when you get into some of the tracking. If you run into that problem where it is not crisp and sharp, you might have to micro focus adjust the lens. I've posted a video on that as well. And another piece of information that I can give you is that Canon is saying we need to use faster shutter speeds than normal. So if you're typically shooting a certain sport at 1 500th or 1 1,000th of a second, it might be worth it to, you know, try 1 2,000th of a second. So simply because of the density of the sensor, we, we have to treat this a little bit differently than we would most cameras. And, you know, I, I've heard it from a few users there, you know, they get it out of the box, they go out and shoot, they're frustrated and they wanna go back to their 70D. I can tell you right now that the sensor in the 90D is way better than pretty much every Canon APS-C sensor out there with the exception of the M6 Mark II because it's the same sensor. This is a great camera. Most of the shooting that I've seen with it has been pretty spectacular. It's the wildlife and sports shooting that has been you know, frustrating some people. Something else you're going to need to be aware of is the cluster that we are shooting with. In live view, obviously we have different clusters here. In sports shooting, a lot of it's going to, going to be done through the viewfinder. So let's come out of this. And we can access the clusters by pressing the cluster button. It's right next to the shutter button. So these are, are the clusters and what they look like. And we can select them by pushing the cluster button. You can see that we get these different orange highlights as we go through each. Spot AF is a single square. It's actually smaller than a single square. You can kind of see it designated here. This is going to allow us to select a very small area to focus on. And in certain cases of wildlife shooting, if the animal is still, this makes a lot of sense because it's giving a very precise location for the camera to look in. When I'm shooting sports, I usually go with a single square. It's a little bit bigger and it allows me to move the focusing squares around through the viewfinder. You would see an overlay similar to this. I have a focusing video we've already done on YouTube, but the problem comes with birds because birds are smaller and they're faster and they're moving around. And so if I'm dealing with something very small, I will go with a nine square cluster or even a large zone, which is one of the three quadrants. In these 
zones, what we're doing is we're giving the camera permission to look within the brackets that we've selected, choose something that has a high degree of contrast that's close to us, and to lock onto that in terms of the tracking, to try to predict where it's going to be as our focusing systems are engaged. So with sports shooting, very common for me to jump back and forth between a nine zone cluster and the large zone cluster. We also have the auto selection area, which uses all of the focusing squares. The camera's looking for an area of contrast. I don't really use this in sports shooting. I use the these three more than any of them. And I let the subject matter determine which cluster I'm using. My recommendation is to choose the smallest cluster for your sport. If it's people, you can typically get away with single square because people don't move so super fast and it allows for some precision. If you're shooting a very fast moving subject with nine cluster, because the camera may not be focusing on the exact part of the subject, and with rapid changes, it's normal you know, to miss 10% or 15% of your shots, that's completely normal for a good camera. So if there's an expectation that every single shot is going to be in focus, that's just not reality. There's, there's always, you know, 10 to 15% of the shots that miss. But to summarize the clusters, you are going to choose a focusing square according to the sport that you're using. And I demonstrate the actual practice of this on the crash course, how to move the focusing squares, how to track all those things. Something else that's very common with sports shooters is back button focus. And I talk about this in other lessons, but let me show you how to set it up real quick. Come into our custom buttons here. It's in this Q screen. We can access a lot of the other settings we've talked about. Here's our quality. You can come in to set up customization for the buttons and you'll see on the left, we have this little highlight of which button we are about to customize. So we're going to come into the shutter button and move autofocus and we're going to select the item that has metering only. So here's metering and autofocus and this is metering only. What that does is it removes the halfway shutter button depression. And so now when I push the shutter button halfway down, it is not engaging focus. AF on by default is going to engage the focusing systems. And so when we push this, it's telling the camera to focus. And when we lift our thumb up, the camera is no longer focusing. And I also demonstrate this technique on the crash course. A lot of sports shooters love to shoot this way. Focus, 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 and then they shoot with the shutter button when they are ready. Before we get into the menu system, let's talk about metering. When we're talking about the metering modes, this applies to the program mode, shutter priority mode, aperture priority mode, and even the manual mode when we have auto ISO turned on only. If we don't have auto ISO on, it does not apply to the manual mode. What's happening here is the camera is looking for patterns of light within the frame in order to know what it should change its shutter speed or aperture to, depending on the mode we're in. It's basically how the camera knows how to change those settings. If you are a pure beginner or an intermediate, I just say start off on evaluative mode. But if you, you get into a situation where you're shooting a subject that has very bright highlights around it in the corners, you may want to come to partial or spot metering. That is going to look at a tighter area within the frame. And I demonstrate this on the free tutorial if you want to check it out. For now, I'm going to leave it on evaluative metering. Canon. I believe made a mistake, I've already made a video on this, on its ITF tracking, which is the intelligent tracking and re recognition. By default, it starts off on zero. I recommend turning it off. If you have it on zero, I'm basically going to be looking for facial patterns, and it seems to trick and confuse the camera often. Some users have gone back to ITR without face detection, and in certain situations, that can help. I think a lot of this is going to be sports sensitive depending on the type of shooting that you're doing. What's going to happen in regular ITR without face detection is the camera will look for a pattern after that first shot. So you can take the picture, it is gonna be either colors or shapes that the camera's processor will try to lock onto. Again, you, you might have some mixed results with this. And so for the troubleshooting, I've told people to turn this off, but it's something you can come back to. For the sake of convenience, I just wanna show you some of the basic settings to set up the camera for sports and wildlife. Now I cover the technique of sports shooting 
on the full Canon 90D crash course. I cover video, I cover flash, I cover landscape, portraits. There's a ton of information on that video. But let's talk about the setup if you just want to get ready for sports shooting. Your mode typically should be either aperture priority or manual mode. In aperture priority, we dial in the aperture and the camera is going to pick the shutter speed. If you go this route, and I, I prefer shooting this way when I'm shooting sports, especially when we have clouds or the light might be changing, keep an eye on your shutter speed and make sure that it's fast enough. This is something that the camera is going to designate. And if it's not, what you can do is bump up your ISO and you'll notice that the shutter speed will be changing. I'm obviously indoors right now. So we don't have a ton of light, but this is basically how I shoot with aperture priorities. I'm keeping an eye on my shutter speed to make sure the camera is selecting something that's fast enough for the sport. And this is gonna be critical for sport shooting. I also shoot on manual mode if I want to lock in my shutter speed and to lock in my aperture to make sure they don't change. We can use auto ISO if we are in, let's say an indoor arena and the light changes. This would give the camera permission to change the ISO as we're shooting. We'd stay locked in with the shutter speed and the aperture, and the camera would make adjustments to the ISO. So those are the two basic modes that I recommend. You know, people shoot for sports mode, but it seems to be a little bit easier sometimes in aperture priority. We're going to come out of live view by pressing the start and stop button, press the Q button, just get this black overlay screen, and we're going to set up some of the other settings in here. If you are shooting sports, you are definitely going to want to select AI servo. This is the camera's focusing for moving subjects. It's, it basically tells the camera to focus over and over and over again as focus is engaged, whether we're using a back button focus or a halfway shutter button depression. So the camera is typically going to focus when we push the shutter button halfway down. And the AI servo basically means that as long as our focusing clusters or squares are on our subject, it is going to continue to refocus. When we go to one shot, what this means is that when we push a shutter button halfway down, it locks focus and it will not change, which is why we don't want to use that for moving subjects. The AI focus is a hybrid of those two. So for sports shooting, definitely AI servo. Second thing you're going to want, obviously, is a high burst. This has to do with the drive mode. 10 frames per second, we have low speed continuous, we have, it's not really silent shooting, but we have a high speed continuous and a low speed continuous. 10 frames per second is going to be the maximum. If I'm not mistaken, the low speed continuous burst is like six or seven frames per second. So if you don't need that full 10, it actually can make sense to, to use the lower speed burst. So at this point, we need to start thinking about whether we want to shoot RAW or JPEG. So let's come into our menu, and there are advantages to both RAW and JPEG, we're in image quality. You're going to find this on the red tab, page one, very top. I go into a lot more detail about image quality and what these files are, are going to do for us. But the short version is that if you are shooting RAW, those files are going to be larger. They're going to contain more information. They're going to allow for greater editing. They have far more color data, latitude, terms of dynamic range. The problem with this is these files are large. And so when we're shooting in RAW, you're not going to get the maximum burst that you would you would see as compared to JPEG. Typically, it's going to be something in the 22 to 25 range is what I've seen with regular RAW. And if you go with compact RAW, or smaller version of RAW that still retains most of the data, you can probably get 30 to 35 frames, depending on certain variables, like what kind of card you're using, and what we see is the camera is trying to clear those to the memory card as quickly as possible. So I know there, there are many sports shooters that prefer the C-RAW over RAW, first of all. However, I also know that there are a huge number of sports photographers who like to go with JPEG. We have Smooth L, which is large, JPEG. And you can see the resolution up here in the top right-hand corner. And you can also see the number of shots remaining, how that changes with Jagged L. So I know many sports shooters will actually shoot with Jagged L simply because the file size is smaller. They can take a ton more images on the same memory card. It's about twice as many. And the buffer is deeper. So they can get that 59 to 60 images in a single burst. And a lot of this is going to depend on the type of sport or wildlife that you are shooting, how much action. And you'll know when you run out of the buffer, it'll 
slow down and you're, you're going to hear it slow down and you're going to have to wait. There is, in live view, you can see that we get this buffer preview up here in the, in the next to the bracket. So the bracket is how much space we have on this memory card. And then to the right of that is the number of shots the camera is predicting. When we're dealing with smaller file sizes like JPEGs, what happens is the camera starts writing it to the memory card. And so you can actually get far more than what it indicates there. Not so many when we're talking about something like RAW or JPEG and RAW together. See how it comes down to 18. In reality, this is probably about 22 or 23. File size and the number of images that you're going to get for each burst, as well as how long it takes to clear the buffer is going to be dependent on the type of file that we are selecting, whether it's raw, JPEG, JPEG smooth. You can also choose a smaller file size. Uh, you know, you can go to medium. Again, we get the megapixel resolution here, 15 megapixels for M, 8.1, so it's small one. Then we've got small two, 3.8. And so sometimes people ask, are you able to get a lot more images in the burst? Well, it turns out that not quite as many as we would hope for, simply because the camera has to do work in converting the raw image into a JPEG and it slows the processor down. Going to have to make some decisions in terms of what you want, JPEG versus RAW. A lot of that is going to depend on the sport that you're shooting, how fast you need those images, how fast you want the buffer to clear. I know many people are, are typically either choosing C-RAW or Jagged L. One of the two. Now, in this case, I am going to demonstrate C-RAW. Okay, we're just gonna come in here and turn off JPEG. And there is something you should be aware of is that even when we are shooting in RAW format, the camera still creates a JPEG. And it does it to display the image on the back of the camera. It's not something we can easily access in our memory card, but it is still a JPEG. So there's always a JPEG, whether you select RAW or not. And because the camera is making adjustments to the JPEG, the thought is, is that when you're shooting many, many, many RAWs, the idea is to turn off a lot of these JPEG only processes. For example, the lens aberration correction. In my opinion, if you're shooting JPEG, it makes sense to leave these turned on. If you are shooting RAW and you're trying to squeeze as much data out of the camera, then you would come in and disable these. That's the thought on it. But again, this strategy is going to change if you are a JPEG shooter. So it would look something like this. The lens aberration correction applies only to JPEGs. And what this is doing is it's telling the processor to clean up a lot of the problems that we see with vignetting or distortion, chromatic aberration, depending on the lens that we're using. The idea is it's going to recognize Canon lenses. And there's an advantage for JPEGs to use Canon lenses that are recognized because those JPEGs are going to be cleaner. If you're a JPEG shooter, definitely leave this turned on. If you're going for RAW exclusively, then you would come in and turn them off. And there's a number of other menu items that we can turn off to try to squeeze more data from the buffer. We can come in and turn off our auto lighting optimizer. You can see mine's already turned off. Highlight tone priority is something that I typically leave turned off for sports shooting anyway. White balance, I, I typically like to shoot in the color temperature that I'm in. If it's sunny, I'm going to come in and pick the sun icon. If it's shade, I'll pick this. If it's changing, I'll pick auto white balance. If you're shooting raw, all that color information again is retained and you could basically shift it any way you want. Color space is sRGB, unless I know this is going to go into print or a magazine. And then in that case, I would choose Adobe RGB. Picture styles, basically these are the instructions given to the camera to create JPEGs. If you're shooting raw exclusively, they don't really apply. They're, they're going, going to apply to the thumbnail. You can squeeze some processing out of this. And I know some people like to come into standard and customize it using info. And you can see that sharpness has three different variables in here. And so you can tweak the settings to make it more sharp in camera. The reason why I don't like to do this for JPEGs is because I can do it on a screen with a big monitor and I can see it better. Whereas it's, it's not so easy to undo this if it's over sharpened. I just kind of leave it where it is if I'm shooting JPEGs. Some of the other settings that we have are the ISO speed noise reduction. Again, this applies only to JPEGs. And so if you're an exclusive raw shooter, you would come in here and turn this off. Same with long exposure noise reduction, I turn that off. ISO speed settings, we can come in and change our ISO. This is basically the same as doing it from the top of the camera. 
The ISO speed range is the minimum and the maximum ISO for the camera that we can set. And the auto range is what we allow the camera to change to when we're using auto ISO. So in some cases you may want to turn this up or down. The minimum shutter speed applies to the program in the aperture priority mode. This is how we give the camera permission to select a shutter speed. When we have it set to auto, the camera is going to choose a shutter speed relative to the focal length that we have of our lens. So if we're shooting with a 400 millimeter lens, you could expect that it's going to be at least probably one 400th of a second. But we have the ability to come in here and use faster shutter speeds. So we can come in here and dictate, hey, use a faster shutter speed, depending on the lens we're using, or use a slower shutter speed. For the most part, auto standard I think is fine. And you can also come in to the manual minimum shutter speed. So we're telling the camera the absolute minimum shutter speed we want it to use, and it will not use a slower shutter speed than what, whatever we select. So if you're shooting sports a lot in aperture priority mode, and you know you want minimum of one 500th of a second, you can come in here and set it that way. I think that's a, probably a pretty good place to start if you're a sports shooter. I'm going to leave it to one 125th because I do a lot of other kinds of shooting. But you know, if you're doing portraits in something, you know, slower shutter speed is required, you would need to come back in here and change this. So we're gonna hit OK, come back out to our main menu. In the blue tab, most of these deal with playback of the images and you know raw processing in camera, things of that nature. But on item four, we can control the information displayed during playback. Essentially, anytime you scroll over a number and you see this information change, if you want it appearing, you would want the check mark there. And if you don't, you just remove the check mark. It's really preference up to you. We can also display a brightness or an RGB histogram. We're gonna come back out to the menu. Highlight alert, when this is enabled, what will happen is you'll get this flashing black and white where the image is overexposed. Some people love it, some people hate it. And then we have the auto focus point display. When we have this turned on and we're shooting through the optical viewfinder, what will happen is you'll see a little red square on your image. It's not really on the image. What's happening is the camera is telling you which focusing square you used when you took the picture. Sometimes that can help with troubleshooting. In the yellow tab, we have the ability to select different folders that we want to shoot in. We can create new folders by coming into the file numbering. Continuous basically means that when we change our memory card, the new memory card will pick up where the last one left off in terms of the file number. If we come into the auto reset, basically what that means is that when we change the memory cards, the file numbers restart. We also have the ability to do a manual reset. So if you're shooting and you want a new folder with, you know, starting from 0001, you would come in here and hit OK. Stuff like that's sometimes pretty useful if you're shooting multiple events in a day. I leave the auto rate rotate feature on and the format the memory card obviously is going to wipe the memory card clean, start over. The page two, there's some important stuff in here, especially when we're dealing with screen brightness. When we come in here, it's me holding my hand out, we can change the brightness of the image in terms of the display. And sometimes when you're shooting outside and it's very bright, it can be it can be difficult to see what's on the screen. If that happens to you, you're going to want to come in here and turn this up to be able to see that you know what you're shooting in. Something like that. It will drain your battery faster. It's been my experience is that when you turn that up and you do a lot of playback, it can make a difference. Bring an extra battery sometimes. And then we have the screen on off button. Something else I need to point out that I failed to mention earlier is that the menus will change a little bit depending on whether or not we are in live view mode or optical viewfinder mode, which we're in right now. So if you come into live view and you come back into your menus, you can expect some of the things to change. It's kind of a, kind of a thing that throws a lot of people off. And so we just lost this menu item I was about to tell you about. If we turn off live view, here it comes back. Screen off on button basically means that when we're shooting through the optical viewfinder, if we press the shutter button, what happens? What changes? So basically, let me demonstrate this. It remains on, I'll come out and show. So when I push the shutter button halfway down, you can see this little gray where the Q screen is. 
and this screen stays up. If come in here and go to the shutter button, tap shutter button. Now when I push halfway down, the screen disappears. So it's, it's a battery saving feature. Some people prefer to have the information screen stay up while they're shooting through the optical viewfinder. Some people prefer it to turn off, really preference. I turn off the mode guide and the feature guide because I think it slows me down when I'm working through the menus. We have our text size on standard. We have different viewfinder displays. This flicker detection might be useful when you're shooting indoors because what will happen is certain LED lights, certain sodium-based lights, they flicker and it can change the exposure between each shot. So we can come in here and actually show when flicker detection is turned on. And you would see that in the viewfinder, the camera would be giving you this warning. This feature deals with merely displaying whether or not the flicker feature is on. In order to turn it on, it's back here when we come into our red tab. It's something that I don't typically use unless I see something weird going on. And you can come in here and turn anti-flicker shoot to enable. Just know that when you do this, you can expect the camera to hesitate a little bit. And this is why I don't leave it on most of the time is because when I'm shooting sports, I just want the camera to take the picture, get the shot at least. Anti-flicker, you'll miss some shots because the camera's waiting in between those pulsatings of light for the right moment. We can't see it with the naked eye, but try it out in a gym or something like that where you got sodium-based lights or LED lights and you'll notice the camera seems a little bit slower. Before we get into the custom focus features, something I want to point out, what we're going to do is after we get through all of these settings, as we have set it up, we're going to come into custom shooting mode and save all of these settings either to C1 or C2, which is on your mode dial up here. So what this means is that after you've gone through all this setup and you have everything dialed in the way you want, whether it's RAW or JPEG, you know, all the custom focusing features, servo, all those things, we're going to save them to C1 or C2. And that way, when you want to jump back to it, you would just flip the knob over to C1 or C2 and you would be good to go. Something that's awesome about this is these settings also respect the custom autofocus settings. So when we come in and we start changing some of these autofocus settings, for example, a very specific sport that we're shooting to and we've got it just the way we want, we can come back and select C1 or C2 and these settings will be remembered as well. Your menu settings are respected when we do this. After we get this camera set up the way we like it, definitely save it to C1 or C2 and that way you don't have to go through all these settings every single time you do this, right? And we'll do that before the end of the video. We're going to come into the autofocus customization stuff. So I've already talked about changing your ITR to disable. Maybe enable, but the, the zero is definitely creating some problems. We have 16 different little menu items here. And some of these are very useful for changing how our focus changes. It's very important to at least start off on the default modes because if you come in here and, you, and we tweak a bunch of things and we don't really remember what we're doing, could cause some problems in other places. Another thing about this is it's going to be very sport dependent. If you're shooting a tennis player, for example, it's very different than football because you, sometimes we have a chain link fence or another obstruction depending on whatever it is you are shooting. So it just really depends. Custom function one of the auto focus deals with whether we want the camera to stay committed or locked on to a moving subject as it, for example, moves off of our focusing clusters. It continues to track in the same direction. That's what locked on refers to. So if you're having some tracking problems, this might be something that you want to look at in order to improve your shots. If you come to responsive, what this means is that as the subject leaves the autofocus points, we're telling the camera to lock on to a new subject. If we were to come all the way over, the camera is going to be very aggressive focusing on the closest subject to you, and it's not going to be as committed to staying locked on to you know, a subject that's been moving across the autofocus point. So keep that in mind. Again, I like default to start off with, but if you want to track a subject a little bit more aggressively, try negative one, maybe negative two. If you want the camera to reset more quickly to a new subject, you would come over to plus one or plus two. Looking at the second item, this is another good one 
the acceleration deceleration deals more specifically with how the subject matter changes its speed and direction. So if you're doing something that doesn't really change speed and direction, you could turn your acceleration and deceleration down. And what this is going to do is again, remain a little bit more committed to those slower moving subjects. If you have rapidly changing subject matter, you might wanna come over to plus one or plus two. Just know that when we turn this up, the camera might become a little bit unstable in its focusing re-engagement. So as we're trying to re-engage focus, it may hesitate, it may miss. The best advice I can give on this is to definitely test it out one at a time to see if it improves it or not. But again, this is dealing with tracking. So if you have a stable subject that doesn't move, it doesn't accelerate in different directions quickly and the camera's jumping around too much, you might wanna turn this down. If it's rapidly changing direction and motion and speed, you come in here and turn this up. But again, the main thing is that you test these one at a time depending on the subject matter. Birds in flight, I would probably turn this up a little bit, one or two. Point switching has to do with giving the camera permission to change which auto focusing points it's using. So this is going to deal specifically with the nine cluster, the large cluster, and then the entire screen. So if we want the camera to change its focusing points, we want it more aggressive, we can turn it up to one or two, but it only applies to those three clusters. The warning that Canon gives on this is that sometimes when we turn this up, focusing points that we don't want will be more likely to be selected. So custom function 2.4 deals with the first image when we first start shooting in a burst. Do you want the camera to prioritize taking the image, which means it might be out of focus, or do we want it to prioritize being in focus, which means that sometimes the camera will hesitate. I think equal priority is good, for the first image, that's just me. I know a lot of people prefer the release. They would rather at least try to get something. And then we have the ability to change it for the second image. So the second image after the first, do we want the camera to be prioritized towards the shooting burst? Or do we want it to prioritize towards focus? So anytime we shift it towards focus, you may notice this lag. It's like this little hesitation. If we turn this towards the speed, then you're going to, going to get those 10 frames per second that you want. We're telling the camera that, hey, we want those 10 frames per second. Again, this is something that I leave on equal priority. So item number six, what do you want the lens drive to do when it's having a hard time achieving autofocus? Do you want it to stop focusing? That would be item one. I like the default here, continue looking for a subject to focus on. We have the ability to determine which of our focusing clusters will be available as we toggle the cluster button up here. I have all, all of mine turned on. And we can do the same for live view, which clusters are available. I like auto focus area selection button. It is the cluster button when we're talking about how do you want to select the clusters, simply because you can re-engage that button and it'll toggle through. If you go to main dial, then we would have to push the button and then rotate the main dial to select our clusters. So this is, let me show you what that looks like. It's kind of a, it's one of these preference things. So we have to rotate it. I like being able to toggle the cluster button to do this, but whatever you like. Item 10 deals with when we hold the camera in the horizontal plane, or when we take the camera and we rotate it 90 degrees into the portrait orientation. This feature allows us to tell the camera to remember the last focusing square we used in each of those orientations. When this is turned to zero, it's just going to stick with the same focusing square no matter what you do. But when you turn it to this guy, a lot of these are kind of confusing. We have very similar looking symbols. It basically is the optical focusing cluster in the live view focusing cluster. So I have mine turned to one, and that means as, as I'm rotating back and forth between those orientations, the camera will remember the last focusing square I used. If we don't want to do it in live view and just go optical only, we, we could come here, but I have mindset to one. When we go into the autofocus area, whether we're in live view or using the optical viewfinder, this feature here, number 11, allows us to tell the camera which focusing point we want it to start from as it's choosing you know, the face detection or it's choosing through those squares. You can come in here, I think auto is fine. You can set this to be position two, which means that if you go from spot or single square, it will begin focus from those points, or we can choose the auto focus point when those modes are engaged. Short answer, 
is leave it on auto. I posted many videos about the ITR, which is the intelligent tracking and recognition. I believe Canon made a mistake. This is all through the viewfinder, by the way. Turning face priority on because it's telling the camera to focus on faces and you may not want those faces focused on. I've told the beginning 90D owners to turn this to disable, work on the technique, make sure your lenses are good, make sure they're sharp, practice the technique, learn how to operate the camera. If you do a specific type of shooting, and I've gone out and I've tested this with this turned off completely and I was getting great results. I shoot in controlled situations with controlled mo motion and movement. And if you get into a type of shooting that's maybe more erratic, it could be worth coming in and, and turning this back to enable which is going to look for shapes and patterns. You get a focus lock, the camera should be looking at shapes and patterns. That might help some of the tracking, but it, in my personal experience, I've tested it on disable, not having any of those problems. Just keep that in mind, highly erratic. If you're not getting the results that you want, it is worth coming back and at least testing it. I believe the face priority is a mistake. This should be somewhere not default. If Canon is gonna have a default setting, it should be on enable or disable, one of those two. However, for basic sport shooting, I have mine turned off and maybe, maybe we'll see some changes in a firmware update that will rearrange this or maybe change how they behave. That's just the best information I can give you at the time of this recording. Autofocus point selection is basically when we're moving a focusing square, I have it turned up to continuous. It allows you to go from the right side and if you push right again, the point will jump over. Same thing with up and down. Otherwise, when it stops at the edge, you have to kind of go back towards the center. It's kind of a pain. So I have mine selected to one. Autofocus point display. I have mine constant, which one I have selected so I can see it. Some people like seeing all of the focus points constant. And so these are just different ways to display the autofocusing points that you're using. I really don't recommend disabling the display. It makes it harder to know what you're doing. Something you'll notice is that when you are changing your focusing squares, sometimes we get this like red overlay. It's like a light. When it's set to auto, the camera will do this depending on how bright or dark it is. When we have it turned on to enable, it'll do it every time. If we turn it off, obviously you wouldn't see it. You'll notice that we have this Q option that allows us to determine this specifically during servo autofocus. If you wanna turn it off, you can. If we don't wanna see this during AI servo, you can have it off. If we wanna see it, you can turn it on. Just another nice feature. I have mine set to, to auto. And then finally, we have the micro adjustment, which I've talked about in another video. When we've done all this stuff, we can come back to our yellow tab, page five, custom shooting mode, we're gonna to go to register settings. I'm gonna to go to C2, hit okay. And once we have done that, the camera will remember all of those settings. The beauty of that is I can come into my mode dial, flip it over to my custom two setting. It's giving us a little mode indicator. This deals with all the settings that we had just done. So we don't have to go in and reset this up every time. It's one of the great features about the 90D is that we can save it to a custom mode position. That way, when you come back to your regular shooting, you can just change those settings as you normally would, and you can flip back to your C2 setting, and you'd be ready to go in a second. That is a, an in-depth detail video on how to set up our Canon 90D for wildlife and sports shooting. Some of the resources, we've got a ton of resources for Canon 90D owners. I'm trying to really produce the best content if you own this camera. Check out the free tutorial on the overview. We have a Facebook group where you can meet other Canon 90D owners and see images. We talk to each other, help each other troubleshoot. Check out the list of lenses that have enough resolving power. Check out my Canon 90D playlist. So tons of videos there. And if you enjoy this type of instruction, definitely check out my Canon 90D crash course, which goes into the advanced real world shooting techniques. In any event, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for watching. And I hope to see you on the Facebook group.